I started playing basketball in Split, Croatia. Back in the days of old Yugoslavia, we would put a hoop on the top of a garage made uh, from some old barrel. Find the old uh, bag of potatoes and then put that as a net. You know, back then there was tremendous arrogance from Americans toward European players. They're not good enough, not tough enough, which is kind of the opposite since, you know what, they, they grew up in war zones. <laughs> Igor Karkovic, who was my first coach, saw me on the beach. He walked up to me and he goes like, well, I see this small head right there. And then I see seven feet away these two like feet. And I didn't know if it was two people swimming or one person swimming. So I would like to have you start playing basketball. And I told him, well, I'm practicing soccer. I like soccer. And he goes like, no, 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 no. Forget about soccer. I was probably 15 years old. Oh my gosh, back in Croatia, like 1980 something probably, you know, high school. Walking in the new building, me and my girlfriend, and we kind of got lost and, you know, I said, oh, I remember the tall guy over there, follow him, you know, like, the whole class will go show up at the basketball game and he will say, like, everyone was there but you, you know, like, I really didn't care that much, you know, like, yeah. I first heard about Tony for Jerry Krause around well, it was the early 90s, I guess. I remember Jerry talking about this young player and the skills that he had, six foot, 10, point guard type. Jerry Krause had a reputation for finding diamonds in the rough. We used the 29th pick in the draft to, to take Tony, and uh, hopefully uh, somewhere down the line, uh, uh, that'll show big dividends. It was a different time. You weren't seeing videos on Twitter of him and things like that. It was more kind of word of mouth. You talk to different scouts, and they would say, oh, yeah, this guy can play, and, you know, he's going to be good. And... We had the right coaches, the right group of people that wanted to teach us fundamentals of the game, the, the, the little love for the game. It was also a different era because the international flavor and the international game was not as established as it is today. The tapes of the NBA players started uh, coming to Europe, so you would have these highlights of Dr. J, uh, Moses Malone, Lakers, Celtics rivalry with Magic, and then Bird. Michael was just starting with the Bulls. The dream was, let's see what happens. Maybe I'm going to be good enough to go to the NBA and then maybe one day play there as well. At that time, people didn't just go, especially at age 20, to like to play basketball overseas, like you know, it was too far. Right after we drafted him, uh, Kraus and I went to Croatia, and I saw Tony play. A really easy, flowing player who was confident of where he was and had a great court presence. Remember, I'm not a scout, but I think I know a good ball player from a bad ball player. I don't think a lot know this. Kraus and Reinsdorf were kind of evacuated the next day because the war had started. <laughs> they flew in there, and they flew right out. I always had a connection to the Chicago, even playing for Benetton. And it was so easy to follow the Bulls, those first three championships. The Chicago Bulls have won their first ever NBA championship. Knowing that I was drafted by the Bulls and I have a chance, if I want to come over to actually get to that team, it, it was uh, special. He was, I mean, and I know how much he loved Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen and watching the Bulls and all those kind of stuff following NBA. I mean, even on our wedding night. The night we're getting married and everything, I said, we guys can uh, party till like three o'clock and uh, then there's a game uh, of, against Phoenix on TV, so that's when we all go home. And I uh, watched the, uh, the finals. I achieved everything that, that, that I could possibly achieve in Europe, and I felt that I should go to see how good I am. It, it was literally a, a day when I, when I landed, I went to the Berta Center and I see all the cameras, all the trucks, all the media, and I was told that Michael's dad uh, was killed. When I lose a sense of motivation and a sense of to prove something as a basketball player, uh, it's time for me to move away from the game of basketball. It was strange, it was a very sad day. 
Uh, a lot of players were, were crying. Um, it, it helped me in a way to realize the bond they had among themselves, sharing that, that, that feeling, that moment, with just being my, my first day, my first hour with, uh, with that team. How can you make the Chicago Bulls better than what they've already accomplished the last three years? Uh, I know that it's, uh, it's very difficult to make Chicago Bulls better because uh, they're already three times on the road a world champion. Uh, everything uh, the people said about me like a good player was in the Europe. Now uh, Jerry said that I'm a new rookie here and uh, I have to start from that point. Once you were on those Bulls teams, you were a Bull. That's a nice move for a man 6'11". Tony came my last year. You know, Jerry Krause, he was very excited about the potential of Tony. We were the group that was just coming off winning championships. You know, he, he was going to have to earn it. You know, I welcome Tony. Tony's bringing his crowd to their feet. We had just lost the greatest player who ever played the game. Bring us help. Actually, I met Tony the year before he came to the Bulls. We played against each other in Italy. He was the star of the Italian League. When we first got here, there was an instant bond because both of us were new to Chicago. He was my height. He could put the ball on the floor. Penetrate to the basket, post up against smaller players. Wasn't the strongest guy in the league, but really had great ball handling skills and could shoot. spectacular type of player. Tony was um, you know, a guy who jumped off the screen when you watched him. Skill level combined with his size, you know, it's so rare to see a guy 6'11 who can play like a guard. His, his understanding of the game and how it should be played, and that fit perfectly into what the Bulls were all about at that time and, and the type of coaching that Phil Jackson wanted to do. Man, what, what a weapon. He just gravitated to that triangle offense like he, like he knew it. You know, obviously once he came in and you got to know him and you saw his skill set, it was really easy to uh, you know, become friends with him and like him and, and integrate him into the team. He was a guy who could play make, uh, create off the bounce, dead-eye shooter, very clutch player. He just kind of had this little shake, you know, and he'd, think, he'd get you thinking he was going to go right, but he'd end up getting back to his left hand. Sometimes I just feel like I never really knew just how good he was. So like, yeah, sometimes I'd look back up some of his old Bulls highlights just to, like, relive it again. The fun he used to have and to be the guy that was making, you know, fun passes, getting excited about their teammates. Another great pass by Kukoc. And some clutch shots. Bring down the house, Tony Kukoc. There was a song called Tootsie Roll, and he would just constantly sing, Tootsie Roll, do -do 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 Tootsie Roll. And it was just, I don't know why, we all found it hilarious. Really understood how and when you were going to be open. And I haven't even talked about his passing. I mean, his nickname was The Waiter because he just had great vision and great hands and was able to pass the ball. Tony. Wow. The sky. Making passes off the dribble, throwing the ball behind his back. Today's game, you talk about big guys doing Jokic in, in Denver has that vision. He's able to pass the ball. Well, Tony was doing that. Tony takes it. Oh, yeah. Stacy for the layup. Beautiful pass. Tony pushed it up. Stacy with the post center. In a sense, maybe Michael not being there that year, it kind of opened the door for me to, to more playing time, to more minutes, to maybe play more natural of my position. You think back to that team, adding Tony on, Scotty coming into his own. You know, we almost went to the finals that year. That was, that was a pretty good team. We were a system offensive team at that point, you know, running the triangle, and his skill set fit into that perfectly. He was basically a seven-foot point guard. And that's what he was, a guy who saw the court, and as we say in this era now, to stretch the floor, you know, tremendous shooting touch. Cook coach, looks at nice. it. Finds Purdue with a great feed. Tony could put him ahead. Yeah. What a show by Tony Cook coach. Well, it all comes down to one, at least you would think, one opportunity. I remember Phil saying, like, okay, you're going to take a ball out of bounds, try to find the Horace, it's going to be a play on the other side. If nothing develops on the other side, take a ball, you, you got a couple seconds to try to do something. Gives it back, Tony, long three. Yeah! Yeah, yeah two counts! Two counts with a three! Yes, sir!
that was my first time, let's say, that I that I kind of felt, okay, the coaches and the teammates are trusting me to take these shots. It happened a couple times during that, that season. I think Christmas against Orlando. Out of three, it is Kukoc. He hits the left hand. Two seconds remaining. Chicago takes the lead. Orlando falls for time. And then the uh, famous Reggie Miller uh, Bob. Look for Miller to pop out. He'll get the screen from Mitchell. Five seconds, four seconds, three. Here he comes. Fade away. Yes, Miller hits a big one. It's not a three. Reggie Miller hit a shot with three seconds, two seconds, bows in four different directions. With eight tenths of a second remaining, Reggie Miller takes the bows at the stadium in Chicago. And then Tony at the buzzer, hit, you know, wins the game. Tony got it, put it up, look out, he got it! You know, one of the, one of the great I'll show you moments ever. I saw it millions of times. People send me that, that video, Reggie, although the great player, how he should know better than celebrate before the game is over. Be the ones that saying like, oh, that was more than eight tenths of the second. <laughs> Stuff like that, that I ended up talking about way, way too much, but it was really important for us, for, for our uh, confidence, for, for energy and everything. We were really playing good basketball that year. You know, on that team, we had Scotty, and Scotty was phenomenal. Scotty carried us that year. He won 55 games. With him. But Phil understood, and frankly, we all understood, Scotty couldn't do it by himself. Scotty, Phil just said you weren't in because you asked Adler to play. Yeah, pretty much. Or you weren't involved in it. Exactly. When you say exchange words, what happened? I have no comments on that. You know, nobody really quite was sure what was happening. Obviously, uh, you wanted Pippen to be, to be in the game. We were destroying the Knicks. I think we were up 20 points in the fourth quarter, but the Knicks just wiggled it away and tied it up. And you know, that game goes into overtime. We're done. We're cooked. And Scotty's going to sit here. Grant, Kukoc, Armstrong, Kerr, and Myers are the five that'll be on the floor. You know, Phil draw up this play. Me personally, I, you know, I didn't care who took the last shot. I wanted to take the last shot, but that it wasn't going to happen. Scotty was our best player. Scotty was our engine. I called him a million times. It's not a secret. He's an ultimate teammate because he does everything right. He does that dirty job of defense and helping and rebounding. And at the same time, he can score great in transition. And that's why the team trusted him in the last couple of possessions to take, take over the game. So in a huddle, Phil said, OK, Tony's going to be the one that gets the ball at the free throw line. It's the same play as it was against Milwaukee back, and that same play against Indiana. Same play they executed plenty of times when Michael was there. It was always the same play. Bob comes into Tony. Look out, it's on line. Yeah! Bulls win! Bulls win it! Two coach with the lifesaver! I didn't hear the whole conversation in between Scotty and Phil. It was clear he wasn't upset with Tony. Scotty felt that, that he had earned the right to take the last shot. He would have reacted the same no matter who was told to take the shot, as long as it wasn't Michael Jordan. See, people don't, if you're not there and you hear all this media stuff, and well, if you're there, you know these two guys have a great, great relationship and still have a great relationship to this day. A lot more would have been made of that story, probably, had he missed the shot, but he didn't. Tony was a tougher-minded guy than he was given credit for. And Tony did not shy away from the moment. You know, walking off the court, you know, just, you know, like, like that's my memory of that moment. For a non-championship game, that arena was just, it was on bonkers. It was, it was, it was fun to watch. Something like that. Something like that. First time I golfed, I was horrible. First time I, I actually hit the ball once or twice when I was in Italy, but I haven't started 
playing golf till 1997, 98. And that's why everybody golf here and I kind of got the bug. But I was, I was absolutely tragic. I, I was shooting 120, 130, just was gripping a club and just wailing at it. He was terrible, brutal. Um, I'm not sure he knew which one, end of the golf club to swing or anything else. Played his first round of golf with him. Tony's favorite club was his foot wedge. We were in Orlando for the playoffs and uh, we were staying at a, a place that had a golf course on it. And Tony got up and took a swing and hit the ball sideways and hit the ball washer. We were there when he first started, you know, dumping balls in the water in Orlando, so and now he's like a scratch golfer. Uh, that speaks to his competitiveness and his drive and how he, he wants to be good at things. A friend of mine who's a good golfer said, like, if you really like the game and you're going to play the game, get a lessons from somebody good. So I took a couple lessons from uh, Jim Suddy, who was teaching the PGA guys at the time. He was at the Cog Hill here. And uh, he actually told me how to hit the ball decent and things I got to work on. And after, like, 15 lessons, I went down to like mid 80s, shot mid 80s, and from that point on, I'm, I'm like crazy. I don't know why I'm crazy about the game, but I'm crazy about the game, and I'm trying to learn as much as is possible. Who is this guy? It's just fun. I, I, I miss the competition competition, so this is my only way to get it done a little bit. And you can trash talk, which is, and a bonus. <laughs> if you are willing to and able to do what he tells you, he's a very good golfer and a good teacher. It was hit good. It was hit perfect. He just touched the tree and, and he stayed in a rough. Go on, Serki. I'll manage. It's a part five. Way easier that I make three, four footers. Maybe because I see a hole from this height, and I kind of my eyes go straight to the hole before I hit the ball. But day by day, sometimes, sometimes I make all of those. Sometimes I just can't touch the hole. With it. I love about it. You can't blame it on anybody. You can't. There are no teammates, no coaches, just you, and and, and trying to stay focused and, and hit good shots. He's kind of taken the competitiveness of basketball and that and put it into golf right now and he's worked on it he's a phenomenal golfer. You know I can remember uh, maybe four or five years after Tony took up the game being in a golf smith up by the Burtho Center. Tony was coming out of the back out of the shop and I said what are you doing and he, he said well I'm having my wedges ground they, they grind them to a certain so there's a bounce and loft on them and Tony was back there, I think, with the guy doing it himself. When I saw that, I said, this guy's serious about this. It was all about my, my number seven, 177 to the hole, uh, seven iron, and I hit it straight in the hole. It, it literally hit the back of the hole, made a dent and, and, and fell in. That was my first hole in one. And I had a last year, two years ago, uh, here on number 11. There are a bunch of pros that, that don't have him, so. It shows, you know, what a natural great athlete he was, hand-eye coordination, that he could take up a sport like that after basically, you know, never playing, you know, walking out the first day on the tee and barely making contact, and then becoming a guy who, you know, is scratch golf for playing around the world. Is that a Hall of Fame? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, and a pen to sign your autograph. Did you see? And a pen to sign the autographs. Nobody asking for my autographs, but I'll use it when I go to school. <laughs> this is not good. But it's not about a first quarter, it's about a fourth quarter. This is my life in the summertime when I'm not in Croatia when I'm here. But it's nice. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Get that one. And that's how the cookie crumbles. Yeah. <laughs> I'm back. 
That's all Jordan said on Saturday. That was really all Jordan needed to say as his 17-month retirement came to an end. Tony understood, you know, when Michael came back, that this was Michael's team. It started uh, immediately after we lost to Orlando. Very disappointed. I think, uh, you know, my intentions coming back here was, you know, to have a chance. You know, I felt we had a chance to, to win it all and uh, just try to get it all out of the system and start over. Michael basically said, I'm taking a seven days off and I'm getting ready for the next season. Not the warning to everybody else, but it was a sign, okay, I want you all to be ready for the next year because next year can be special. My first season was in 95, 96 season and it ended with Tony hoisting the sixth man of the year trophy. So by that time, I think it was pretty apparent that the guy could play. Tony driving to the lane. Nicely done. Early on in that next season that Michael bought into what Tony could do and understood that, you know, that's that's another weapon. New coach on the move to Jordan. To speak the door. Oh, oh, oh. Yes! I didn't think Tony saw Michael Strigham. He was the man in Europe. Now he's one of the men. Good coach drives in, double pump, puts it in. Fade away, tough jumper from Tony in the corner. I think Michael and Scotty considered him not just a teammate, but a valuable teammate. Pippen on the spin. Nice. Tony staying all the way on the outside. Tony, what do you got? Another three? Do you? Do you? Yes! 34, and that's a career high for Tony. Standing ovation for the Bulls, trying to win their 44th in a row at home. I always said that those teams, especially the second three feet, but the first one too, you knew as a broadcaster you were going to see something that night that you had never seen before. Tony denied that little interior. Oh, Beautiful beat oh, on the back oh, feet. Jason Cameron! Oh, man! They won our play of the game! What elevation! The Chicago Bulls are the first team in NBA history to win 70 games in a single season. Right now, good shot, give the ball right now to Tony. Kukoc, 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 i pobjedili. I pobjedili smo i number one. Ovako, reci, number one. Ovdje, ovdje Barbie. Number one. Tako je, number one. Ring is going back to Croatia. After Tabak winning with Houston, Ring is going back to Croatia. Two, two on a row. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Every year that went by for Tony, uh, he had to have been more comfortable playing alongside of Michael and Scotty. He became a trusted teammate, and that's, that's really what it's all about. I had great connections with Scotty, with Michael, with Steve, with Luke. Dennis would develop these little things, uh, switching players, uh, helping defense, running the floor, passing at the right time to the right people. Tony had some monster games in the finals. Get up, 97, we were really relying on him more than we had to in 96, times when he just completely dominated the game and, and, and took over. And you know, what an amazing luxury to have a guy off the bench who could do that. Jordan did not have the shot. That was a, a fun, fun bunch with Steve, with Bill, with Luke, with Judd, with Harp, with Dennis. The times that we actually spent together off court, those early breakfasts, the, the dinners on the road. I remember early on, and it might have been an exhibition game that we played, and a, a group of us 
went to have like our pregame meal. It was on the road. And I remember Steve Kerr being there and I think Tony ordered a glass of wine. And this is a pregame meal. Tony ordered just this massive amount of food, like a salad, two entrees, dessert. And he ordered a glass of wine too. And this is like four or five hours before the game. And I said, Tony, you're gonna eat all that and have a glass of wine on the day of the game? And, and he said, and you order, this is how we do it. We, we glass of wine, lots of food, drink espresso, and then go, go back to the hotel, take a big shit, and we're ready to play. <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> let's do this. <laughs> yeah, one of, one of uh, Tony's great highlights, really, and, and it's almost never spoken about, is game seven against the Pacers in 98. And it was only the second game seven the Bulls had in all, in all those playoff runs. Michael, as I recall, Michael and Scotty struggled some, and, and Tony really had the game. He made the shots, he made the plays that allowed us to win that series, because Indiana was a, a really good team and a very difficult matchup for us. And, but, but Tony had that game seven that, that really we needed. You would never hear Tony say, hey, remember game seven in 98? Remember what I did? He was a guy who knit together all the pieces all the time, a facilitator, great teammate and somebody who's about winning. I remember this story Phil Jackson had told me. It was game five, and of course we all celebrate game six in 98 when Michael hit the shot, the pose. Chicago with the lead! The Chicago Bulls have won their sixth NBA championship, and it's their second three-peat. Jesus Christ, we deserve it. People forget game five. Jordan on Russell into a crowd, dishes out to Kukoc. He is just on fire. Tony shoots 11 for 13 and has got 30 points. Out to Kukoc for three. He hits it. With 5.5 seconds, it's a one point game. And they got a last shot coming to win the game back in Chicago. And John Paxson had actually gone to fail late in the game and suggested to give the shot to Tony because Tony is not missing anything. And Phil, like the rest of his fans, said, hey, you know, got to give it to Michael Jordan because he's our last shot guy. Into Jordan, a prayer. We go to Utah. And afterwards, Phil told John, you were right. I should have given the shot to Tony. We, we, we never guessed it and nodded at each other. The trials and tribulations the whole year, and it ends like this on another team's court. Scotty Hurt, got your performance. I mean, Every, everybody. I mean, the, the Scotty was unbelievable. Michael, everybody. Everybody. I mean, I don't know what to, what, what to say, but I guess it, it's just the heart of, of uh, this team. I'll rate it number one because it's the latest one, and it's and it's the sweetest one. Thank you. You're welcome. Number one, chance. What Jerry used to always tell me about uh, Tony was that when he first scouted him and when he first signed him, what he envisioned Tony doing was elongating the careers of Michael and Scotty because he could take so much attention away from them with his different skill set. And what I saw was a guy who just complemented both those players perfectly because you had to respect his shooting ability, you had to respect his size, you had to respect his playmaking ability, and you had two Hall of Famers alongside of him and Scotty and Michael. And as we all know, those guys ultimately not only accepted him, they embraced him. You try to put yourself in people's shoes. And here was a guy coming over, first time experience playing in the NBA, huge hype, huge expectations. And to be able to manage that and handle it, that's, that's tough. For him, it was a team game. And he wanted to win championships. He wanted to be part of something special. I think if you asked Tony Kukoc, I know if you asked Tony Kukoc, he wouldn't trade that for anything. He was ahead of his time like way ahead of his time. If Tony had been on a team where he was the best player, he would have scored 25 points a game. Yeah, he would have been, you know, he would have been at an all-star level almost every year he played. Um, he, he was just, he was good. I mean, he was really, really good. Tony's got 11 rings. Tony's won 11 championships, European championships, Yugoslavian championships, Italian championships, and of course the three with the Bulls. The things that he did over there as a young player, that, that's where it started for him, and that's where I think the league is, is wise in recognizing you know, the international player. His junior uh, international career with some of those national teams, his Olympic career, 
I mean, this is one of the better international players of all time. And then he comes over and plays an integral role on a three-peat NBA champion, winning a sixth man of the year, a major award in the process, and assimilating himself as he did. To me, it's a no-brainer. He was one of the early pioneers, you know, one of the guys who proved to the rest of the world that players could come over and compete with NBA players. He'd be a very effective player in this day and age, and, and possibly more so than he even was back in, back in his day. We always talk about the most underrated players. He's the most underrated player of all time. He was a guy that probably was better than what we saw, and what we saw was still pretty good. Yeah, he's a good family guy, and he's an easy guy to talk to. And uh, you know, the only time you get a little excited is if you tell him that Michael Jordan's a better golfer than he is. <laughs> and that, that gets him going. I'm assuming I left some mark in this this game of basketball. I, I did something right. I was part of some really good basketball teams. I feel fortunate enough, lucky enough, if you can say that uh, uh, right people, right coaches, the right players. Welcoming Tony to the Hall of Fame are two men who were instrumental in making Chicago the center of basketball universe in the 1990s, Michael Jordan and Jerry Reinsdorf. For the waiter, the wait is over, Tony Kukoc. I would like to thank these gentlemen here, Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen. for kicking my butt during the Olympics in Barcelona and then, and then motivating me to work even harder to become an important part of the Chicago Bulls. My sincere gratitude goes to Mr. Jerry Reinsdorf and the late Jerry Krause for insisting on bringing me to the Bulls and believing in me as a player when it was common for non-American players to play in the NBA. And for my friends, who are here tonight making this night even more special. Thank you all for coming. It's well known that this is a team game, that you can't win and be successful this game by yourself. You, you need your teammates, you need your coaches. I guess the people from Hall of Fame uh, saw something in me and decided that guy is going to be to uh, 2021. Uh, Hall of Fame bunch. Well, I, I'm, I'm probably Michael Jordan of golfing in between me and him. What's up, Bulls fans? For more videos, click here.